My father was Judge Albert Cartwright, once Lieutenant Governor of the state. He was killed two years ago in a mysterious accident. We were not only father and son, but, but friends. The shock of his violent death still haunts my mind. My nights are troubled by strange dreams. You've come back to me. I'm happy again. Mother, no. This man isn't father. I thought my happiness was gone forever, but you've come back to me. Mother, listen to me, Mother. Don't waste your breath, Paul. She can't hear you. I am your father now. You're not. You're not my father. Dorothy! Dorothy! What is it, Paul? Dorothy, speak to Mother. Tell her he isn't father. Tell her. Of course he is. Look at the lovely bracelet he gave me. Isn't it beautiful? It has a lion's head. Dear father, thank you. Thank you so much. I'll go out and get breakfast started. Fall too, Paul. Here's your breakfast. you said once in psychology class about the phenomena of dreams foreshadowing future events? Yes, but to healthy-minded people, a dream is just a dream. Come on, Paul, there's nothing like an early start for good fishing. Doc, I'd like to go home today. Home? Why, Paul, what's the matter? I'm worried about Mother. Now, look, you're not going to let a dream spoil our outing, are you? Why do you suppose Mother didn't want me home for the holiday? Oh, well, she probably had some reason. Now, get on with your breakfast. I'd like to tell you about this nightmare I had, Doc. Well, all right, if it'll make you feel better. Let's finish our eggs, and I'll get the tackle, and you can tell me on the way down. Hmm? He said, you have hallucinations. Come with me. I'll take care of you. And he held on to my arm. That was when you woke me up. Quite an extraordinary dream, but easily explained. At the inquest after your father's death, you remember, the engineer on the train testified that he caught a glimpse of the Acme Trucking Company sign as the truck pulled away. Although nothing's been seen of it since, it still remains the only clue to the unsolved mystery. Naturally, it would be impressed upon your mind. Well, yes, but... And the Schumann Concerto was your father's favorite composition, if I recall correctly. But it all seems so real, and I remember every detail. The bracelet, the abandoned farm buildings, and the things this man said, like, it's just what I've been waiting for, and the terrible danger to Mother and Dorothy. Forget it, Paul. You've been working too hard at school. This is a perfect way to relax. Hey, they're jumping like crickets. Come on. Field 
trust and forwarded it up here from the school, and I figured it might be important, so I brought it up to you. Oh, thanks, man. No trouble. If there's any answer, I can mail it for you over in the village. Well, there's no answer. It's a letter from my father. Huh? Say, you're not pulling my leg, are you, Paul? Oh, no, Max. Dad left a series of letters with the office of his estate. I get one every few months. Well, I'll be doggone. Leave it to the judge to think of something like that. Uncanny smart that man was. Well, you want to read that sort of private. Good fishing, huh? Fine, Mac. How long are you figuring on staying up here? Oh, Doc. Yes, Paul. Would you mind coming over a minute, please? Not so long, boys. Goodbye, Mac. What is it, Paul? I received one of Dad's letters. I'd, I'd like to read part of it to you. Go ahead. It will be your responsibility as the man of the family to protect your mother and Dorothy by being constantly vigilant of their associates. I have always guarded your mother, who is so much younger than I, for in my experience, I've had ample opportunity to observe the cunning of unscrupulous imposters. It's right in with your dream, doesn't it? Curious coincidence. Oh, I hate to ruin your trip, Doc, but I'd really like to go home. All right, Paul. It wouldn't do you any good anyhow with this worry on your mind, and if everything's all right, we can come back. Meantime, I can have a nice little visit with my sister. Let's get our stuff. Thanks a lot, Doc. You're welcome, Paul. You can reach me at my sister's. Okay. So long, Doc. Hello, Van. Mr. Paul. Well, this is a surprise. Oh, I got kind of homesick. How's everything, Ben? Well, everything's about the same so far. Where's my mother? Mrs. Virginia, she went over to the club to have lunch with Mr. Curtis. Curtis? Well, who's he? Well, he's been coming around here every day for the past month. You mean he's been coming around to see Mother? He sure ain't been coming to see me. No, sir. What's he like, Ben? Well, he's fine-looking man. Nice talking, too. But they ain't exactly my place to venture an opinion, no, sir. You don't like him? Well, you see how it is. Being with the judge so many years, I got to know just what folks he like and don't like. And I kind of suspect this Mr. Curtis wouldn't be on the list, no, sir. I see. But don't you take no preconjected ideas from me, Mr. Paul. Take constitution, like the judge used to say, to exert undue influence on the bench. No, sir. That's right, then. I better take your bag upstairs. Should I run you a bath, sir? Oh, never mind. I'll just take a shower. Yes, sir. George? Yeah. Well, for guy's sakes. Well, where are you? Well, why didn't you let me know? Come on over. I want to talk to you. It's confidential. Okay. Mr. Paul is home. Paul? What brought him home? Well, uh, he said he got homesick. He's up in his room. Didn't you like the fishing? Oh, it was all right, but I wanted to come home. Well, I had so many engagements, dear. Of course, if I'd realized I'm that... clean, Mrs. Cartwright. Who's the Romeo? Benjamin told you. Well, his name is Brett Curtis, and he's most charming. You know, I haven't even been slightly interested in any man since your father died. But I must admit I like this one. You'll meet him tonight at dinner, and I want you to like him, too. Are you sure he's all right? Of course he is. Everyone finds him fascinating. He's amusing and interesting. He's been everywhere, and he's most attractive. 
You know, in some ways, he reminds me of your father, except he's younger. Oh, don't look so worried. Well, you're my responsibility now, you know. Paul, you know how lonely I've been. Yes, I understand that. Darling, I've got to change. I hope you have a decent suit to wear. I've been bragging about how handsome you are. I'll probably slide down the banister in my pajamas. If you dare. Oh, excuse me, Mrs. Cartwright. Hello, George. How's Lydia? Poorly, ma'am, poorly. But she'll be all right when she finds out Paul's home. <laughs> Hiya, Paul. The old guy. Gosh, I'm glad to see you. What's all this confidential business? How about this guy my mother's got in tow? Oh, him. Well, what gives? Does he rate? By me, strictly poison. Dorothy and I are washed up on account of that guy. Oh, George, says she. You're so crude and callow. Why can't you be more like Brett? Smooth and sophisticated. Women, they get on my nerves. Sounds like a purely personal reaction, George. I'm after facts. Is he solid? Well, all I know is what I hear at keyholes. Mom and Dad say he's a cosmopolitan. But for my dough, he's a first class... Oh. Hello, sis. Hiya, small fry. Hello. Well, what happened to the fishing trip, Paul? Canceled on account of family affection. What's with this Curtis I've been hearing about? You've been listening to George. You can just ignore it. Brett's positively out of this world, and the princess is mad about him. Yeah, and so am I. Well, at least he has manners, which is more than I can say for some people. Mm. Of course, it must be quite a shock to realize that one simply doesn't measure up to civilized standards. See what I mean? You know how we used to get along. Now where am I? Oh, take it easy, George. It may blow over. No, nah, she'll never be the same. And I'm too old to change. Really? There he is now. Fred, how are you? For me? Oh, you're too divine, Brett, really. Bring some flowers, a big droop. <laughs> You'll simply turn my head. Turn her head? I'd like to wring her neck. She thinks he's a great wit. But nothing I say is funny anymore. How about staying to dinner, George? I don't feel like facing this alone. Okay. I'll call up home. You'll have to lend me a tie. Oh, sure. Gosh, do I look all right? Maybe I should have gone home and changed. You'll do. How nice you both look. Paul, this is Brett. How do you do? I'm glad to know you, Paul. Of course you know George Hanover. Hello, George. I've been hearing quite a lot about you. Well, Mother and Dorothy have been giving you quite a build-up, too. <laughs> well, I hope you won't hold it against me. I feel as if I'd met you somewhere before. That's because Brett looks like Father. Oh, well, I don't think so. Except maybe his nose a little. Thanks, Paul. I'd rather not look like anybody but myself. Paul is a great deal like his father. I understand you have his talent, too. Maybe. A speck of it. I've been reading one of his books on criminology. My friend, Professor Muehlbeck, the psychiatrist, recommended it to me. The professor thinks your father had a brilliant mind. Well, father's best book was never completed. I hope I'll be able to finish it for him someday. I knew you two would like each other. Yes, sir, ma'am. Dorothy? Oh, thank you. Paul, I have everything you want. I you don't mean to tell me you like him. I didn't say I liked him. I just said I could see why Mother likes him. Yeah, but does Dorothy have to drool over him like a goon? Oh, Dorothy's nothing but a child. Child nothing. She's a first-class flirt. The way she hangs on that guy's words. Honest, Paul, it sickens me. Pure jealousy. Me? Jealous? Yeah. Gosh, that's right. Maybe I am. Oh, look. It was in the box that the corsage Brett gave me. Isn't it beautiful? It's a lion's head from India. Brett has such divine taste. Well, don't you like it? Nice girls aren't supposed to take jewelry from strange men. He's not a strange man. Paul, what's wrong? You're as white as a sheet. Thank you. 
What's the matter, Virginia? What happened? I don't know. Dorothy said he simply keeled over. When he came to, he babbled something about a dream and wanting to see you. He seemed all right at dinner time. Let me see him. Feel better? Say, you know, I had an uncle once. He used to get fits. They had to put a spoon in his mouth. Hello, Doc. Well, young man, what's this all about? Darling, what is wrong? Nothing, Mother. If you don't mind, though, I'd like to talk to Dr. Benson alone. Well, I guess I'll watch along home then. Hope you feel better, chum. Well, I'll be okay. See you tomorrow. Right. You look feverish. Oh, I just had kind of a mental shock. Remember the dream I told you about this morning, Doc? Yes. The part about Dorothy and the bracelet? Yes. Well, there's a man Mother's seriously interested in, and... Who is this man, Paul? Brett Curtis, and he did give Dorothy a bracelet. But Paul... And it was in a corsage, and, and there was the music, the same music, the Schumann concerto. This may sound kind of crazy, Doc, but... that dream is beginning to happen. Now, wait a minute, Paul. Nothing has actually happened. The only similarity to the dream is the bracelet, and that could be a coincidence. You know, Dorothy's very fond of trinkets, and anybody who knew that might buy her a bracelet. As for the music, it's probably sitting on the piano. I wouldn't worry too much about it, son. Have you told your mother about this dream? No. Mother thinks I've got too much imagination. Besides, she's gone overboard for this Curtis, and you can't talk to people when they feel like that about someone. You were pretty young to know that. Well, I felt the same way about a girl last year. Nobody could tell me anything until I found it out for myself. And you may be entirely wrong about this man. Now, the best thing to do is to find out all we can about him. Suppose you and I go down and see Bill Allen tomorrow. A banker doesn't usually take people at face value. And we'll let him investigate. That's an idea. Oh, and Doc, when you go downstairs, I wish you'd drop in and meet Curtis. I'd like to find out what you think about him. All right, Paul. Now stop worrying. Come on, Paul. Mr. Allen's a busy man. Well, thank you, Mr. Allen. Goodbye, Paul. Goodbye, Bill. Doctor. Good morning, Curtis. Oh, good morning, Doctor. Hello, Paul. How are you feeling? Oh, I'm fine, thanks. You certainly gave us a scare last evening. I hope you've laid down the lot with Doctor. What he needs is more fresh air and exercise. Well, you can't pass exams on fresh air. Not in my school. No, Paul takes his studies very seriously. Come along, Paul. Good morning, Curtis. Goodbye. I don't suppose he followed us here. Oh, come now, Paul. The man banks there. Aren't you convinced that Alan knows what he's talking about? My intuition isn't. I take it easy on that intuition business, son. It can become an obsession, you know. Well, if you don't mind, Doc, I think I'll walk home. Well, that's a splendid idea. Do some deep breathing and try and rid your mind of Curtis. Hi there, Doctor. Going anywhere near the club? I go right by there. Hop in. Oh, thanks. It's a nuisance to find a taxi when you want one. I don't drive myself. That's unusual. I thought everybody drove these days. Well, I was in rather a bad accident when I was a youngster, and it made such an impression on me that I never learned to drive. Where's Paul? Oh, he decided to walk home for the exercise. Not letting me know a thing about coming home. 